Thank you very much, and I want to thank Day and Pat Ferenga for having me here. I consider them two legitimate American heroes. Uh, the education establishment hasn't agreed with me up till now. Uh, I have an explanation to make why I'm going to sit as I deliver this uh, this talk. It's because I'm exhausted. That's why I, I don't want to faint on you. The, the talk is actually taken from, if I'm not mistaken, a single sentence in this 310,000 word book in the back. So uh, other books remain to be written, hopefully not by me. The, in my opinion, the most uh, important American figure in education, in official education of the 20th century, was the Dean of Teacher Education at Stanford University, a man named Elwood P. Coverley. Now, you've undoubtedly never heard of Dr. Coverley, but all of the romantic myths about school as, a, as an equality builder and school as a way to enlighten the ignorant masses uh, undertaken by dedicated people, all of those come from Dr. Coverley's official History of American Education, first published in 1919 and then, and then republished again in 1934 for at least the first half of this century. Coverley's history was it. There were no competitors at all. Uh, the part of Coverley that most of his readers were unaware of is the Dr. Coverley who had organized the entire United States into administrative districts and in fact was the head of something the press used to refer to as the Education Trust. They would pick promising people passing through college for administrative roles in major cities, the important administrative jobs. Uh, the the uh, whole account of that's in a book by, I believe, a Boston writer, David Tyack. Uh, managers of virtue, but apparently by the end of the First World War, all of the administrative jobs that mattered in the United States were under the direction of the Education Trust. That might explain a mystery that that constantly recurs in, a, 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 in American schooling, that although we have 15,000 individual school boards, it hardly is any different here than it is across the nation or in the southwest or in the northwest. It's very, very uniform uh, American official schooling. Uh, and there, there are other mechanisms besides uh, control of the administrative jobs that do that. Anyway, one sentence in Coverley's book awakened the talk tonight. And it's, so it's part of the 310,000 words in underground history. Coverley said, somewhere around page 700 of his history, which I doubt if anyone ever read, from, certainly not from cover to cover, that a decision had been made to extend adolescence four years. A couple did not elaborate on this. It was just dropped off there. And I thought about that for several years. I said, who possibly could make such a decision, why would they want to do that? So for the next hour, I'll be exploring who did it and why. After I sit down, let's hope these mics work. If I, if I tell you that this was just finished this morning, I'd be lying. It was finished late this afternoon in my motel room, but I've been working on it steadily for about eight weeks. The deadly paradox of extended childhood. To begin to grasp the extent of the great social experiment standing behind the visible structures of mass compulsion schooling. Am I being heard? No. That must mean there are switches here. How about this? Okay. To begin to 
grasp the extent of the social experiment standing behind the visible structures of mass compulsion schooling, it isn't necessary to conjure up conspiracies of the classical variety, but only to look at child rearing from an engineering point of view as animal training beyond the reach of the animal to fully comprehend as when a, a falconer shrouds his bird to prevent it from obeying its nature, or when a horse racing association dictates that lead be attached to a fast horse's saddle to bring its performance in line with the rest of the pack. In both cases, bird and horse are less than they would have been, having been reduced to instruments of a different species design. With schooling, too, it shouldn't be difficult to understand that from certain perspectives, it might also be desirable to alter the behavior of human children negatively in the interests of some managerial goal. Whether a thing is good or bad depends on one's value system. We all understand that. How otherwise could we begin to understand the bald statement made by the famous Dean of Teacher Education at Stanford in 1919 that the term of childhood had been deliberately extended for four years because important people wanted it that way. What could the Dean, that's Elwood Coverley, have meant? He didn't bother to elaborate. You seldom get to hear the problem of modern schooling framed as a conflict between the purposes of social managers and the purposes of individuals, families, and communities, because the 23 global corporations, which control most of the flow of ideas and news and information worldwide, seldom find it convenient to encourage such speculation, nor do academics in general, because it's a very bad way to get tenure. But nonetheless, this is the thesis that I'll be pursuing tonight, that enormous numbers of American children have been dumbed down and made morally incomplete in the interests of a complex theory of social management, one which emerged full-blown among corporate players somewhat over a century ago. School is the principal forge for handicapping mutilations. I'm using that term as you'd use it with a horse race. You handicap it by hanging lead weights on it. The, it is, school is the central mechanism of its effectiveness. The central mechanism of its effectiveness lies in its ability to extend childhood far beyond natural bounds. Extending childhood was not originally the American way, just the reverse. Back in 1839, Alexis de Tocqueville, author of Democracy in America, and if you haven't read it, read it. It will be in every library in Boston and every library in the United States. Tocqueville tried to put his finger on a fantastic difference he had discerned between American young people and the European variety. In America, he said, I'm quoting now, there is, strictly speaking, no adolescence. At the close of boyhood, the man appears, and by inference at the close of girlhood, the woman. That early responsibility, according to Tocqueville, imparted such a great vigor to our society that other nations could not compete, and he predicted it would be progressive and the gulf would enlarge between American power and the power of other nations, which of course it has. Where Europe inhibited the range of the young and rendered them incomplete by imposing an intricate class consciousness, age consciousness, gender consciousness, whatever. America was jettisoning, jettisoning such handicaps to productivity and it roared into global prominence as a result of the advantage this conferred. Tocqueville's analysis at the beginning of the 21st century has the quaint ring of something like Alice in Wonderland, doesn't it? Could, could some of uh, you see him up there? American young people are unrecognizable from Tocqueville's description. 
childhood here has been artificially extended well into the 20s and beyond. That picture behind me, I assumed, was uh, a 13-year-old boy, but because I taught eighth grades for 30 years, but uh, someone uh, in the hall tonight said, no, I think it's 17, but whether that's a 13-year-old boy, a 14, a 15, a 16, or a 17, no one in the audience, nor myself, finds that anything out of the norm. American teenage boys, or if they're well-behaved, are goofy, daffy, they put funny things in their ears, and we all, we all assume that this is natural, a natural stage in child development. Indeed, I heard an older woman about my age the other day say about the two major party candidates for election in this year's presidential race, I'm quoting her now, why they're both so childish. That's the main impression she got from the so-called debates. In truth, it was my impression as well, although I would have cloaked my own discomfort by using the word boyish. That chance con conversation in the supermarket overheard provoked in me a temporary sensitivity to outbreaks of childishness in the world around me. And it wasn't long before others presented themselves. In USA Today, I saw a story that the Little League Baseball Organization had cooked up a series of workshops where parents would be taught how to behave at baseball games. A necessity, the article said, because the prevailing standard of parent parental behavior was so childish it had become dangerous. That very same evening I read that, my wife and I went to see a delightful feature movie in cartoon form called Chicken Run. It was the ninth major film in the past three years presented as a cartoon for adults. All this reminded me that just a few years earlier I had sublet my New York apartment to a young attorney, age 25, a graduate of Yale, who was interning for a Wall Street firm while he was awaiting certification as a lawyer. I was on my way to Spain the next day, so I deposited his check, wished him well, and was off. And on my return from Spain to the United States, I discovered that he had stopped payment on that check. I couldn't raise him by phone, so I called his father, who had been given me as a reference, only to learn from the father that the son had find a, found a better deal that very next day, and apparently both father and son deemed this an adequate explanation for breaching a contract. Fortunately, I knew that the young man still needed to appear before his review panel, before his law license could be final. So I told the father I would show up at that hearing with a formal complaint unless the money was forthcoming too sweet. And when Dad realized I had his boy over a barrel, he screamed into the phone at me. He was outraged. He said I should be ashamed of myself. His son was only 25, and hadn't I ever changed my mind when I was 25? So I could go on, but, but that's enough, I think. Could, could organized schooling have anything to do with these developments in childishness? And if so, why and how? To begin to answer that question, come back with me to the first year of the 20th century where a book was being published by a well-known writer of the day, Edward Eggleston. Some of you will know Eggleston because he had written a, uh, a best-selling novel called The Hoosier Schoolmaster. But in this book of 1901, Eggleston had set himself the task of explaining America's unusual superiority to Europe even though most of us derived from Europe. According to Eggleston, this hadn't happened all at once. In fact, the first generations here, he said, were much like those back in Europe, crippled by habits of dependency and hierarchy, by excessive management. But gradually, the hand of custom relaxed here, and the young began to come to consciousness in a world where anything was possible. 
freed from the social systems of Europe, systems of Europe, America's young eagerly seized opportunities to learn everything and to dare everything. At the age of seven, Eggleston said, Americans put away childish things to carry their share of the load. They begin to grow up. In Europe, on the other hand, ordinary children weren't allowed decision-making responsibilities because the economies of Europe could not tolerate the kind of mind and character which emerges from early mental independence. Individuals there had to be proletarianized into masses for the benefit of factories, factory farms, standing armies, and social class stability. Whatever the particular truth of these contentions, you see that for both the Tocqueville in 1839 and Eggleston in 1900, both were agreeing that childhood in the United States was a short-lived phenomenon and that this was a good thing. A century later, it's still possible to find data to make us suspect that the earlier way has much still to recommend it on a personal basis at least. Studies of very successful adults almost uniformly show that to a striking degree such people grow up quickly, taking important responsibility at an early age. And history provides evidence that at one time, not so long ago, it was in fact the social norm in the United States. In 1859, for instance, Abe Lincoln told the Wisconsin Agricultural Association that the overwhelming majority of Americans, poor as well as rich, had independent livelihoods. They didn't work for anybody. That's the real American dream. Because these people had been reared from early childhood to be self-reliant, ambitious, and resourceful, and no ponderous social order, such as in Britain or Germany, had stood in their way. Just as an aside, the old order Amish in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Ohio and Indiana, in fact, raised all of their children to have independent livelihoods, and they succeed in about 99% of the instances, I'm not citing my imagination or observation, but a recent book uh, from Johns Hopkins about the Amish. Uh, this principle of early self-reliance and adventure leading to future entrepreneurial triumph is still present with us, but it's no longer celebrated in schools. Take, for example, the case of Richard Branson, the founder of a prosperous airline and many, many other thriving businesses in various fields. One day when Branson was seven years old, he was out with his mother on a drive miles from home when she suddenly asked him if he thought he could find his way home from there all alone. Branson said he thought he could, whereupon his mother stopped the car. Well, get out then, she said. Let's see if you're right, and drove off without her little boy. Is there anyone in earshot of these words who has done something similar? Not if you had an A average in school, I'm certain. Whatever your opinion of Mrs. Branson's decision, Richard himself looks back on it later in life as the foundation of his unlimited confidence in himself, which has made him a millionaire several hundred times over. Branson's curriculum aims squarely at the face of the principal myth of modern management, that most people cannot be trusted with responsibility because they are childish and incompetent. They have to be closely watched and managed. The minute Branson exited that car and set out to discover himself, he walked away from childhood. Parents of children who later become successful adults, to a notable degree, to be those who find ways to push their kids into paths of early self-discovery, perhaps because early and significant challenge immunizes people against management myths. 
They don't trust school to counsel their kids best. They operate on the principle that school, as well as other official institutions, is a kind of liar's world. Another prominent managerial myth is the one which asserts that talent and potential are described mathematically on a bell curve or by a standardized test number. Unless I see things wrong, nobody on earth and nobody in this audience has ever once asked their plumber, their accountant, their barber, their doctor, or the police chief what SAT score the chap earned. Nobody sane cares in the slightest. Merits measured in other ways. But it's as if a spell is cast on teachers, parents, and especially kids around test time. A spell which demands that we participate in the ranking of everyone by this artificial and irrelevant measure. Tens of billions of dollars are invested in a ritual of synthetic subordination, the purpose of which remains largely misperceived and universally misperceived by education writers, I believe. We do know that to question this ceremony seriously is the end of a pedagogical career. There are no exceptions to that. Now I'm going to tell you something that I hope will surprise at least some of you. Although I know the audiences that Pat Frank attracts are pretty sharp. Bill Bradley became a Democratic Party intellectual, a Princeton graduate, and a senator with an SAT score of 480 on the verbal. My daughter, who graduated from MIT down the road, tells me that's a moron score. George W. Bush became a Yale graduate a governor of Texas, an oil company executive, and a baseball franchise owner with 550. My daughter says it's not much better. <laughs> Al Gore failed five of the first six college courses he took. And rather than live with that bad record, weighting down his average, he dropped out and registered somewhere else. Now, this is not rhetorical. I'm really asking you, human being to human being, if you can be a senator, a governor, or the president of the United States with a mediocre SAT, why can't you be anything else as well without scholastic tests as a benchmark? Indeed, I think you can be. You can even be a world-famous scientist, as I'll demonstrate in just a minute but only if somebody helps you see how irrelevant the myths of management really are, those myths which are the main lessons learned in public schools. When we talk about extending childhood, when we look beyond the real delight that parents take in the innocent bemusement and dependency of their offspring, it becomes clear that the interests served most directly by a delay of personal sovereignty is something I'm going to call the managerial outlook. The managerial outlook cannot coexist with independence. In school matters, it argues that neither children nor parents can be trusted. In fact, if you had ever seen schools from the inside, as I unfortunately have, you would see that the school neither trusts parents and children, it doesn't trust teachers, assistant principals, principals, or superintendents either. It, they just pretend they're trusted, but they're, they're on short lesions. Uh, it, it argues that the only rational way to organize growing up is through professional goal setting and professional interventions. The more, the better. If you give your schools more money, the money buys more interventions into the child's growing up time. Professionalism, says this point of view, will always produce better results than common sense, than insight, than intuition, than local tradition, than wisdom, 
more than grace. Spurt management is not served by allowing children to grow up or even to grow up whole. It justifies its tutelage by the academic disciplines of Darwinian biology, anthropology, psychology, sociology, and many more, all of which convey the contention one way or another that growing up is impossible for most of us or even a semantic absurdity. These disciplines cannot provide any ideal of maturity as if the concept itself is meaningless. What they aim toward is system efficiency. That's the best human life can offer is the implication. We will remain children forever, always in need of supervision and regulation, always to be kept under surveillance, barcoded, so to speak. The most significant scientific project of the past 50 years, and arguably of all time, would have been impossible if the management theory which drives our schools is really valid. I'm referring to the Human Genome Project, whose leaders, Francis S. Collins and Craig Venter, graced the cover of Time magazine recently. Collins grew up on a lonely sheep farm in western Virginia. He was homeschooled for many years, and he and his mother followed whatever curriculum pleased them for as long as it pleased them, nothing particularly scientific and nothing ever that merited the term organized. His days included plenty of hard work with sheep. Yet Collins, the director of the public part of the Genome Project, had no trouble graduating from Harvard before he tracked the genome to its lair. On the private side, it's an even more startling case. Craig Venter, a wild boy, a terrible troublemaker who almost flunked out of high school several times, cutting class often to go surfing. After the senior prom, when the other kids went off to college, the head of the private human genome project went into the army as a buck private and was shipped off to Vietnam. No college. From these two unlikely sources, a map of the human genome has emerged. Tell me, what standardized test or school person could have predicted that? How many schools would even have allowed the necessary human foundations of this accomplishment to be laid? A great many of us, I think, never got an opportunity to be all that we were capable of because we were caught in a trap of extended dependency, a trap most thoroughly imposed by modern schooling. How did it happen that a condition that Alexis de Tocqueville said didn't even exist in America became the gigantically profitable industry of enforced childishness that it is today, the enterprise that we call secondary school? It would take a week to treat that question as it deserves, but symbolically we could do worse than compress an answer into the, the single man G. Stanley Hall, the principal intellectual villain who reinvented adolescence academically in a massive two-volume pseudo-scholarly tome published in 1904 under the rubric Adolescence. Hall was a minister's son, but the ministry was dying, and all the minister's sons from prominent families had to bail out because church attendance had shrunken drastically. And what did they bail out into? Let me tell you, almost universally, into the new utopian world of forced schooling. It is the creation of the dwindling American ministry of the official religions. He had been John Dewey's own teacher at Johns Hopkins before he struck it rich by bending psychology to the service of American industry and American government. 
mind. I hope you're all aware that the principal customer for psychological services isn't you and me, it's the government. His background shows how intellectual viruses leap across continents. Stanley Hall had been the first assistant to the famous German physiological psychologist Wilhelm Wundt at the University of Leipzig during the great revolution that established Germany as the intellectual center of planet Earth. I, I don't see too well, but I see most of you are too young to remember this wonderful period in human history beginning about 1820 and not terminating really till the beginning of the Second World War, uh, where if you wanted to claim that you were educated or if you wanted to claim the prestige posts, you better have spoken Germany and has spent a year or two in there. The PhD degree was a German invention. It didn't exist anywhere else. The German managerial imperative was grounded in a very low regard for human possibility. And so mass for, for schooling first became the rage and a great success in that Teutonic nation. It was a kind of schooling which extended childhood right into adulthood with heavy-duty obedience training. That's where they, they were so brilliantly good at wars. And if you say, well, they lost the last two wars, not according to analyses of how many people were killed in the various engagements. The Germans regularly inflicted 30% more casualties than they took, even when they were outnumbered four or five to one. So this type of managerial schooling produces very, very fine soldiers. I don't know whether you could extend that to very fine human beings, but soldiers, yes. In Germany, the only val value schooling had for those in power, including university training, lay in its direct and indirect utility to the management plans of big business and centralized government. Personal and family dreams were irrelevant. G. Stanley Hall set out to transfer the German stamp to America, along with several thousand young men from prominent families just like him, all of whom returned with a PhD degree and assumed the directorship of government agencies, college departments. There was no competition. I mean, did anyone else have a PhD? Answer, no. Okay. Uh, after the sojourn of these prominent people in Germany, they came home to assume, really, the management of American life. And they began to season American life with the things they had learned in Prussia and Saxony and Ingolstadt and elsewhere. Now, the most interesting part of all this is that the Germans had made a science out of the study of management. There was only one place in the world that had our equivalent of an MBA degree. And they had proven over and over again that management was wonderfully facilitated if the people being managed were kept ignorant and childlike. Others had suspected this. But Germany proved it. That's interesting, don't you think? I mean, we're talking 1820 now. The German attitude, which, which really mimicked the Anglican outlook of British class society, began spreading like a stain through the fabric of American culture a decade after the Civil War. It spread slowly at first, but relentlessly, and advanced swiftly during moments of national crisis like wars and depressions, and more slow and even retreating a little at other times, but always it marched behind the banner of science and scientific efficiency. Statistical data replaced experience and other traditional bases for decision making. Precise stages of lengthening childhood were identified first by the Germans this age you must do this, at this age you must do this, etc. Excuse my bad accent. It's because I need massive dental work. <laughs> Otherwise, I have speak flawless term. Uh, 
And if you believe that, I've abridged the value. Uh, advice was an infinitely renewable resource, especially if it didn't work. Beginning about 1890, with the takeover of school boards by professionalized classes and businessmen, American popular government was gradually set aside as scientifically unwarranted. Outer forms were, for the most part, publicly honored. The substance was removed as power was transferred out of the reach of the mass public. I mean, what that great abstraction I just delivered means in reality is, for example, the Constitution vests the money power in the United States in the people's representatives, not in the Senate, not in the presidency, but in the House of Representatives. Somewhere around the beginning of the First World War, that power was transferred to a group of private bankers. Those are the people you know today as the Federal Reserve, but they have nothing to do with the federal government. They're private bankers, nor can the government look at their minutes. Since the process that I've just described has become the everyday stuff of our present life, I'd be surprised if many of you find anything objectionable about expert decisions being made by specialists. And yet, shocking as it sounds to ears conditioned as our own have been, the condition of adolescence, and even that of late childhood, has only the shakiest basis in science. We have an abundance of evidence from the laboratory of early America that what we consider perfectly normal behavior in young people is a cultural artifact, not biological destiny. George Washington went to school for the first time at age 11, and the very first subject he studied was trigonometry. Then he studied geometry, then surveying. Five years later, he was the official surveyor for Culpeper County, Virginia. Thomas Jefferson managed a 2,500-acre farm with hundreds of employees at the age of 14. Both his parents were dead. In fact, childhood beyond the age of seven or eight was always an oddity, as in most parts of the world. It is a northern European creation, 400 years in the making. Long before it appealed to ordinary people, childhood was a concept which intrigued kings and counselors for reasons only too obvious. It provides the ideal justification for management. Yet even in our own thoroughly managed society, effective dissenters from these artificial systems of childhood appear regularly. Think only of these prominent female teenage multimillionaires, Tara Lipinski, Michelle Kwan, Venus and Serena Williams. Each grew up early, working harder than a ditch digger to develop nearly superhuman grace and strength. Perhaps all of us in different ways possess comparable promise which dies stillborn because our own early time is taken up satisfying the incessant demands of total strangers. By the way, let me step away from my script just for a moment because I'm a huge fan of the Williams sisters. Their father was a postman who had never played a game of tennis in his life, nor did he have the money to pay for expensive coaches. So Mr. and Mrs. Williams and the girls learn tennis by checking videos out of the public library and reading books, how to hold the racket, how to hit, and then they waited their turn on public courts. Now I know that if, if you've been brought up the way I was brought up, the whole idea of that's absurd, unless you have the very best state-of-the-art training, you have no chance at all to be a Venus or Serena Williams, the daughters of a postal clerk, who decided to make them tennis stars along with his wife because he saw a tennis match on television and he saw a girl being handed a check for $48,000 and he said to his wife, this postal clerk, look at that. Look how easy that is to do. 
we raise our girls that way. <laughs> of course, he didn't have the benefit of expert coaching. He had to do it himself. Uh, okay. Remember the Hubble telescope which sailed into orbit a few years back, nearly blind because its lens had been ground so badly by experts? That particular problem was solved by a one-time farm boy who in childhood had regularly violated child labor laws along with his parents in secret by plowing fields on the family farm all alone from dawn to dusk at the age of seven. That was the background of the man who conceived that a lens grinding robot could make contact with that orbiting expert junk and fix it. Just as he had fixed the tractor all by himself many times as a seven-year-old boy, that practice in ingenuity, self-reliance, and resourcefulness appears to have transferred itself very neatly to the Hubble's problem. A great deal more of our history than we are allowed to realize was made by real people whom we today call children. The first admiral in American history, Admiral Farragut, had command of a captured British ship at the age of 12 off the coast of Peru. Farragut was ordered to sail it to Boston with the enemy crew below, uh, down in the hall, and he did it, age 12. What would Admiral Farragut think of this lunatic? Thomas Edison, a poor boy, described by his school as profoundly weak of mind, was running a newspaper business a thousand miles from home all alone when he was 12 and making very, very good money at it. The name of the paper was the Grand Trunk Herald. Ariel Durant, the co-author of a multi-volume history of the world, which many of us own thanks to the Book of the Month Club, was a fully married woman at the age of 13, married to her lifelong husband, Will Durant, who was 26 at the time. Was Will Durant a pervert, an Ariel Durant a victim, or something forbidden to the modern imagination speaking to us through the Durants and their long, successful, productive marriage? The project of extending childhood was concocted thousands of years ago by male philosophers and reinvented by male philosophers in every age of history only to be ignored. Surely the mothers of the world who ended up saddled with its destructive responsibility never asked for it. Only in modern times did the idea come to be supported by powerful interests which came to see value and childishness for social and economic projects. From Plato onwards, a few thinkers have always recognized that to bring about a closely managed society, ways have to be found to keep the general population uninformed. It's uncanny how steadily that theme echoes through history. It's just that nobody quite knew how to do it or had really had the command over the society to pull it off. And except for specialized functions in the overall system, management is massively aided by making people incompetent. So they're dependent on experts to keep their lives in balance. In particular, rhetorical fluency, which allows unauthorized voices to reach out to others, had to be rationed if a stable social order was the goal. Even citizenship, the concept of active personal responsibility for the community, could not be allowed to spread very far, since only a population numb to the interests of others will accept much management. Early federal America, you know, the beginning of the 19th century, culminating in the leadership of Andrew Jackson, showed just how disturbing the democratic voice could be. It confirmed the suspicions of Hamilton and others. Something had to be done to level American political life to the global standard, to the point where each class 
remains in its classroom, so to speak. It's no accident that a major thrust toward compulsion schooling began a single year after Jackson left office, and I hate to tell you this, folks, it began right here in Boston. One year after Jackson left office, and let me also tell you, they really wouldn't have dared do it while Jackson still had the clout. But it was quickly discovered that German social management by police, army, and church was insufficient to bring the American population to heel. Nor was the gentler childishness of Britain. I just came back from three trips to England last year, and I thought I was in a daycare center of some sort. Nor was the gentler childishness of divide and conquer strategy workable. There really, folks, is a reason why classrooms are called classrooms. Heavy business operations in the Orient, particularly in India, China, and Japan, provided dramatic examples that the easiest way to do this was to deny the majority lessons in how to grow up. The extent to which this has been done is difficult for people like you and me to conceive because we were reared in such a system. What you need to do is paint this moron on your wall so you can look at him every day. One good medicine to sweep away the conditioning is to read Benjamin Franklin's short, clear autobiography and ponder it carefully. Franklin's autobiography describes a sharply different America from the one that we have come to regard as a normal childhood. Franklin was the son of a candle maker in a family of 15, and he was working at a job 60 hours a week by the age of 12. In his spare time, as he describes in this little autobiography, he put himself through an academic curriculum, I tell you, that would frighten a Yale student today. I wasn't a Yale student, but I was a Cornell and a Columbia student, and I can tell you that I never saw anything like the curriculum that Franklin was doing in his spare time at the age of 12. The dreamlike epoch which saw full childhoods lived on government reservations called schools, commenced in embryo about seven centuries ago among a group which called itself, appropriately enough, the schoolmen. Scholasticism was the philosophical discipline that came out of the schoolmen. It imposed a duty on older people to preserve childish dependency because that was thought to be the condition closest to godliness. The books of the young were to be censored, their behavior prescribed, but it didn't really take. Not until the early 19th century in Prussia was scholastic methodology for ordinary people first imposed scientifically. Children were required to attend government schools grouped internally, just as they are in Boston, according to social class and age. Please do not be led astray by the grouping according to your reading score. You're grouped by social class, and of course by age. We're all aware of that. And to be watched over, not by teachers or schoolmasters, but by a group of disempowered adults called pedagogues. Pedagogue, which is a term still with us, is a term from ancient Rome. It describes a specialized slave class who made sure the children attended school and memorized whatever they were ordered to memorize by the master. A pedagogical slave doesn't teach at all, but drills children, then tests them for obedience measured by a memory trace. Does that sound strangely familiar? Tests measure obedience very well, competence much less so, and aptitude not at all. Or else, why is the failure of Al Gore running against their moron, if my daughter's characterization correct, George Bush? Because their aptitude 
wasn't measured by their tested prowess. From German pedagogy writ large, we get the notion of separate costumes for children as a way of labeling people as a less than whole class of humanity. These notions crossed into Unitarian Boston four decades before the Civil War and found important secondary homes in Quaker Philadelphia and secular Washington, D.C. And from those three bases, scholastic medicine, and I don't mean scholastic in the way you and I mean it, but in the medieval idea of keeping children childish, scholastic medicine spread rapidly outward from Boston, Philadelphia, and Washington. It first devoured the middle class mind, then it made steady inroads on the working classes. But right to the end of World War I, working class kids dressed like adults and for the most part thought like adults too, until child labor legislation and a systematic foreclosure of alternative ways to grow up eventually brought the last resistors into line. This notable change in the condition of the young was not the result of popular demand, nor was it the result of influence by prominent socialists like John Dewey, who had no influence at all to speak of. It was the major undertaking of industrial titans like Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, Vincent Astor, John D. Rockefeller, Henry Ford, and the like. The private tax-exempt foundations of these men continue their work to this day, and if you don't, if you haven't heard this anywhere else, there have been two major congressional investigations in the last century of the effect of private foundations on schooling. The Walsh Commission in 1915 and the Reese Committee in 1953, and both came to virtually the identical conclusion that official schooling in the United States is the construction of private corporate foundations. But why? Why did an economic leadership supposedly committed to Adam Smith's capitalist principles veer in this radical direction? An important part of the answer is that while these men operated inside the American tradition, they consciously did not live as part of it. Instead, they yearned for a planetary form of governance which resembled the British Empire and the Anglican corporate theology of that empire more than it did any other political logic. You know, everything in its place and a place for everything. By the last quarter of the 19th century, the promise of unlimited energy and mass production machinery working in tandem began to produce wealth beyond imagining. An industrial utopia was within reach, but only if society could be made susceptible to management beyond any American precedent. Personal liberty and conventional morality had to be surrendered if this promise were to be realized. But there was the Bill of Rights and the traditions and the older ideals standing squarely in the way. Put yourself in the position of these visionary industrialists finding it necessary to suppress the rampant self-reliance with which U.S. society identified itself and to, quote, socialize the majority into dependence upon centralized management. Authority vectors would have to be revised. The authority of the political state had to replace the authority of the family. The authority of church, tradition, and local leadership had to be marginalized as well. The obvious place to start was with children. Adults were too set in their habits, so following German models, the quick arrival of our kids at adulthood had to be ended and replaced with that. The driving motive to do this lay in the requirements of financial capital for safety. Who would risk, and I'm, if you hear a trace of sarcasm in my voice, you've put it there. 
I'm saying this quite literally and directly to who would risk the phenomenal investments in machinery that have to constantly be made in a mass production economy if the markets couldn't be guaranteed. Competition, one bogey of the older American economy, could be muted easily by trust formation, by government regulation, by government subsidies which stack the market deck. But how could the bulk of the people be convinced to give up their individual yearning for independent livelihoods? How could they be convinced not to produce any longer? The great fear of modern American leadership between 1880 and 1920 lay in the area of overproduction. If you get back into the journals of the day, the kind of upper class journals that these people wrote for, you will find this term overproduction on a regular basis. This is the major argument of the day that the, we cannot support the older American traditions and have this wonderfully productive economy. So unless the mass population could be swiftly retrained to think of itself as employees, not as producers, but as employees, and also to think of itself as consumers, defining the value of their lives by how much stuff they could buy and consume, then the perils of overproduction would retard those investments in industrial growth that were vital. And so mass schooling of a compulsory nature was given teeth between 1890 and 1910. You may dismiss any references to compulsory schooling that existed earlier. I mean, you can find them as, as early as, as the 17th century in Massachusetts. They were never enforced. They couldn't be enforced. You needed a police force to make them work. No longer was school charged primarily with fashioning good people or good citizens, except rhetorically on the 4th of July. The new schooling was directed, exactly as it had been in Germany, to the inculcation of habits, fears, and attitudes useful to the new management philosophy of big business and big government. Pulling this off was not easy. It took the better part of 75 years to accomplish, and not really until the so-called Sputnik crisis, where the country went into hysteria because the Russians decided not to eat and produce a basketball-sized thing that flew around the earth for a couple of years. Uh, not until the hysteria of the Sputnik crisis and there is sarcasm in my voice there, was the design finally realized. Even then, rearguard actions were fought. But over time, the corrosive effects of government and corporate money pushed the scheme progressively forward. School teachers, principals, local superintendents, even state ed departments became only pedagogical relays in a system of invisible central management. Keep in mind that this vast scheme was not intended to be destructive, just the reverse. By converting Americans from independent spirits seeking private destinies into specialized economic and social functions, America eventually did achieve the most reliable domestic economy in the world. The human mutilations of schooling were a trade-off for this prosperity, which rained down on the poor as well as on the rich. You need only travel extensively through the world, as I unfortunately have done in the last nine years, to see that the American poor are the richest poor anywhere. Comfort and security were achieved at the price of liberty and self-reliance. And that's why I'm calling this thing 
a paradox. There is a payoff. It's up to each one of you to decide whether being a relay and an incomplete human being is worth the guaranteed benefits. Once you're aware of the logic, the mechanisms are simple to make out. Well-schooled people are trained to obey strangers' commands. Any stranger certified by the political or the social system. Many of these commands, as kids will tell you on a daily basis, are irrational. They don't make sense. But a minute's reflection will convince you that the logic of this, too, is sound. You can't trust people who obey only commands grounded in good sense. To find out if you have an an obedient clientele, you have to issue irrational commands. And when they all nod their head and shuffle their feet and do that, then you know that it's worked. Just look into your public schools around Massachusetts at standardized testing time, and you'll see what I mean. Advertising appeals and advocacy journalism will later slip into the role of lifelong teachers in such a system. Well-schooled people have a low threshold of boredom. They require constant novelty in order to feel alive. That's what the bell ringing every 40 minutes is, and now for something different. Changing classes at short intervals is a drill to prepare kids for changing associates, changing husbands and wives, domiciles and possessions regularly later on. A mass production economy demands that you be bored almost instantly with whatever you bought, whether it's a house or a wife or a sandwich. The schoolroom is a laboratory for experimentation on young minds. Well-schooled people are poorly trained deliberately in the uses of their mind, their imagination, their volition, and their morality. They require lifelong tutelage to make any sense of their days, a tutelage provided by mass entertainment and by mass journalism. The brilliant concept behind this seemingly nasty business deserves some reflection. Over a century ago, great industrialists with the help of academics like G. Stanley Hall, set out to rewrite the laws of supply and demand. You know, I lack the resources to give this its proper due. It is the most revolutionary conception, maybe in human history, that you could reverse the laws of supply and demand and be free of the tyranny of having to give people what they want. You could convince them that they wanted something else, and you could convince them that what they wanted was what your machines made best. And if those machines broke and you got new machines that made something else best, then you could convince them you're free, free of the tyranny of that economic law. Did, I'm not bright enough to think that up, to bring that to you as a fantasy. If you could hear the Yale and Harvard boys chortling about their triumph and discovering how to do this around 1900, and I'll tell you the journals are filled, they're dripping with this stuff. All this sounds nuts, I know. All the more reason that you should demand some reliable verification that the ideas I've spoken of actually constitute a project rather than just a set of accidents. So I'm going to provide you, because of the limitations of time, in the hopes that maybe you'll, you'll, you'll pick up that book that has a lot of verification, but I'm going to provide you tonight with one independent verification, perhaps the most important of all. I want you to consider, especially because you're Bostonians, that the honor lecture at Harvard University given every year in education is called the Ingalls Lecture. 
Now, I would be astonished if even one person hearing, sitting here in this room knows anything at all about Alexander Ingalls, for whom the lecture is named, but I'm willing to admit my error. Is there anybody here who absolutely knows anything about Alexander Ingalls? Well, too bad. That's too bad. I didn't either. I thought I, I, I knew a little bit about everything in the school world. But I didn't know, didn't know anything about Alexander Ingalls. I'd never heard of him until I was reading a horrifying book by the most famous Harvard president of all, James Bryant Conant. He was president of Harvard for 30 years. He is the architect for the comprehensive high schools. You know, we just stuff four or 5,000 kids in. Uh, uh, and in a book called The Child, the Parent, and the State, 1949, as I was forcing myself to read Conant, I came across this laudatory reference to Alexander Ingalls as the single individual who most clearly understood what the agenda of schooling really was. I said no more. It's like, uh, it like code between uh, some secret society and like uh, coverleaf that we extended childhood four years. Uh, so I began a hunt for Alexander Ingalls, and I was utterly unsuccessful until a former student of mine. I mean, his books don't exist in any library in the country. How about that? And the honor lecture at Harvard's named after him. But one of my former students, a fellow who's going to be the next speaker on this stage. Now, he'll deny this because of the criminal aspects, but he had the book stolen out of the rare book room at NYU Laboratory. And to his credit, we returned it eventually. I wanted to keep it. Uh, so on the strength of that, I looked Engels up. Now you know how I looked it up. And managed to obtain a book called Principles of Secondary Education that he had written in 1917. In it, Ingalls, highly praised by the president of Harvard, lists six precise functions of the new American schooling, new in his day at least. So try these on for size. According to Ingalls, the first function of schooling is the adjustive function the establishment of fixed habits of reaction to authority. Nothing in here about reading, writing, and arithmetic. The establishment of fixed habits of reaction to authority in which I learned that stupid orders test this much better than sensible orders. People who follow sensible orders are just sensible. But people who follow stupid orders, those are the people you can trust. This prepares the young to accept whatever managers dictate when they are grown. Second, according to Engels, is the diagnostic function. School determines each student's proper social role. I bet you thought that it was determined some other way. And schools log it mathematically and anecdotally on cumulative records to justify the third function of schooling, the sorting function. School sorts children by training individuals only so far as their likely destination in the social machine, not one step beyond. The fourth function is the conformity function. As much as possible, kids are to be made alike not from any passion for egalitarianism, but that so their future behavior will be predictable in service to market research and political research. I mean, that's quite brilliant. Next is the hygienic function, which has nothing at all to do with health. Or rather, it has a lot to do with the health of the race, as Ingalls and Conant and the school crowd, the architects, thought of the health of the race. This is a polite way of saying that school is expected to accelerate 
the Darwinian natural selection principle by unnaturally tagging the unfit so clearly that they will drop out of the reproduction sweepstakes. Interesting, huh? And last is the propydeutic function. That's a fancy word meaning that obviously a very small fraction of kids will have to be trained to take over the management of this system and perpetuate it. Guardians of a population deliberately dumbed down and rendered childlike in order that government and economic life can be managed with a minimum of hassle. And in conclusion, each well-schooled generation, you get a break after this, each well-schooled generation remembers less and less of the founding vision of America. It remembers not at all that political life here was deliberately arranged to make management difficult. Remember in third grade or fourth grade when hopefully you studied the, the uh, separation of powers? The idea is to make management very, very difficult. Which is, this is not a nation that's about consensus. What we gave the world and still what we have to give the world is argument. Premature consensus is for jerks, for serfs. We need to recall for our children and ourselves that America was given to the world as a place of argument, not as a laboratory of managed consensus. The new American dream of the great corporations and of our great imperial government is that we shall all remain childish and emotionally needy forever because that makes the task of management more efficient. And what I say to you in conclusion is that we should be done with this stunted and dishonest dream because it drives our children mad. They are human beings, not consumers. They are not human resources. I hope at least one person in this audience will break the nose of the next person who uses the term human resources in front of you. Our children are not human resources. They are not a workforce. Just kick someone in the shins who says workforce. They are not a breeding experiment to advance the efficiency of evolution. They are not lab rats, and they are certainly not subjects of an empire. To be quit of the deepening nightmare requires that we first recognize the paradox of a democratic republic attempting to be an empire. The contradictions between what we say we believe and what we do are not resolvable. And that second, we recognize the paradox of defining work as the tasks dictated by great corporations, by government agencies, or by experts. To make those things happen requires that most of us will never grow up. The security and ease so achieved is purchased at the price of our souls. Thank you very much.